Hey, welcome back to Engineers Workshop. I wanted to talk to you a little bit today about a struggle that I've had, I'm sure many of you had, and that is keeping rust at bay or keeping your cast iron machines from rusting. So I have a solution. Um, I've called it the easy but expensive solution, and it all revolves around temperature and dew point. So bear with me a little bit and follow along and uh, I think you'll understand pretty quickly when you can get into trouble. The first thing we need to look at is uh, rising temperature and this axis we'll call time and we want to look at a dew point chart. Now a dew point chart there's almost no rhyme or reason. It could, it could go up, it could go down, it could stay the same and there's, there's no pattern to it if you just look at dew point by itself. It seems pretty random. But if you look at temperature, temperature is pretty easy because temperature, it goes up in the daytime and it goes down at night. And that pretty much follows. Up in the daytime, it may not come to the same temperature, but it goes down at night and it'll do this. And it goes up in the day, down at night, up in the day, down at night. One of the things that you'll notice, despite what the peaks are, in the valleys, look at the valleys of the temperature relative to the dew point at any given moment. And what you'll see is there's a lot of times when the temperature approaches the dew point, but it never crosses the dew point because what happens is when the temperature and the dew point are at the same level, the air is 100% saturated. So this temperature line will never go below the dew point line. Now, what's this gap in here? This gap in here is a visual indicator of the relative humidity. It's the amount of moisture that the air can hold at any given temperature. And when the temperature is here and the dew point is here, that line is very tall. That means the relative humidity is low, that the air could hold a lot more moisture before it got to its saturation point. But down here, you'll see the gap is much smaller. Down here, there's no gap. This is at 100% relative humidity. The temperature and the dew point are at the same point, and the air can hold no more moisture. It's saturated. A lot of times there's fog. There's droplets of uh, water coming out of, uh, coming out of the air. So think about the hot summer day. You're out on your deck, and it's, it's hot, it's muggy, unless you're uh, Aaron in always sunny in the shop in Arizona when it's just plain hot, but if you're feeling hot and muggy, that means there's a lot of moisture in the air, and so you get a cold glass of uh, iced tea or uh, liquor or whatever, and you notice that the outside of the glass is just completely dripping and water's coming off the glass. Well, why is that? The glass, the surface of the glass, is lower than the relative humidity, or excuse me, lower than the dew point of the air. And so the air condenses, the moisture from the air condenses on the glass and drips off. Now, what's happening to your machine tools in this uh, situation here? If you have a shop like mine, and I'll just hang your out here. Too much ventilation. We've got open doors, we've got panels missing, and this shop needs to be tightened up. But basically, the air can freely circulate throughout this shop, and the outside air and the inside air are the same. Your machines are affected by the temperature, and the cast iron surface, which I'm gonna say in green, is always trying to catch up to whatever that ambient temperature is. But then, you know, here it crosses and the machine starts to cool off and it cools off and until it hits here and then the machine comes up to this temperature and then it cools off to this point and then it comes up to this point here and then it cools off and then it starts to come up and then it cools off. Well, where did we get into trouble? We got into trouble right in this little zone here. And the reason we got into trouble is because the, surf, the surface, the temperature of the cast iron surface all of a sudden was lower than the dew point temperature. And so this cast iron surface is now 
the ice cold glass of water and water from the air is going to condense on the surface of the machine. Now, how do you fix this? My simple but expensive solution is to put a little space heater blowing on the machine and elevate the temperature of the cast iron artificially above what it would be. And so there's some amount that I am forcing that cast iron to be at a higher temperature than it normally wants to be. And it still follows and is affected by the outdoor temperature. But it does that. And so in this area here, the temperature of the machine is above the dew point where it would be below the dew point without that additional heat. As long as you can keep the temperature of your cast iron above the dew point, no condensation, no rust. So what does this mean in your day-to-day -day, um, uh, experience? Look for days when you get some protracted cold weather and things cool off maybe over a period of more than a day and then you get word from your weather app that a warm-up is coming and you're going to go from 40s to mid 70s or 80 degrees. Be aware that your machines are going to be cold and then when that warm temperature comes the cast iron surface is going to be below the dew point you're going to get sweating. I can, I can almost look at the weather chart and know what days I'm going to be in trouble but doing this with the artificial heat source keeps you out of trouble. Now let me show you the uh, setup that I have for the K&T and the microclimate that I created around it. This is what I call a microclimate and what it is is just a light wooden frame with uh, foil bubble uh, material around four sides. That's a four foot width and it's an eight foot square frame. I've got that suspended from a pulley on my trolley beam tied over to the wall and I can lift it up when I'm uh, ready to work. Let me show you that. I should mention that this uh, canopy also prevents condensation from dripping on the machine. I was getting a lot of uh, drip off of the purlins and, and it was just right on top of the the table there so this also protects it from you know direct moisture. Don't be afraid to use something like a light bulb in place of a fan. Uh, a light bulb gives off more heat than it does light and the light is a good indicator that the heat is on when you're you know trying to heat a small area or inside a cabinet full of tooling. So after going through a winter season with a lot of days where there was condensation on the cast iron surfaces of other pieces of equipment, the K&T has fared very well. And no, no signs of any surface rust forming. If you look inside the column, I have the space heater just directing its heat towards the saddle and the knee, and it obviously goes up into the head keeps everything nice and warm. Let's look at a few things uh, with the infrared gun and see what kind of temperatures we're seeing. Okay, unprotected machine surface just adjacent to the K&T. Now I want to clue you in on something. It's not 93 degrees. If you feel this uh, surface, it's probably 70 to 75 degrees. This uh, junk garbage thermometer reads about 20 degrees high, but remember that number, if we can just use it for a relative measurement, 94. And if we go and we look at the K&T, the surface of the K&T, 118. There again, this is not 118 degrees. It feels nice and warm to the touch, but probably about uh, 20 degrees above the temperature of the um, adjacent machine. Just looking at the floor, 84 degrees on the concrete, ninety-six degrees on the drill press once again feels like seventies to me and it's eighty-four degrees outside so we have definitely increased the temperature of the surface of the K&T which is the goal and uh, next step is to uh, install 
the immersion heater into the sump in the foot. You know, while I'm on a roll trash talking this uh, Ryobi infrared uh, heat uh, thermometer, you know, don't get me wrong, I'm not going to throw it away, but I was disappointed to find how far it was off. And that about all I trust it for is, you know, telling me the difference between this surface and one next to it. That, yeah, the hotter one is hotter than the colder one, but you really got to take the degree measurements with a grain of salt. So I wanted to tell you about another tool that I was very disappointed in. But going back, uh, if you look at this Craftsman 12-inch uh, crescent wrench, I've had this thing for probably 40 years. And it's a great tool, but the one thing I didn't like about it was it only opened up to about an inch and a quarter. And so I found this Husky 12-inch tool and uh, probably got it at Lowe's or Home Depot. And I was thrilled to see that the Husky, you know, gave me quite a bit more. And if you actually look at this, uh, if you can see it, there's a scale on it that says that this goes up over a half, actually probably an inch and, inch and five-eighths. But there's a drawback to this thing. You know, the, the honeymoon ended once I got it home. And let me show you what it does. So when you use a crescent wrench, you know, you, you get it sized up to your fastener. And then the point from that, you know, is you're going to be on and off this bolt multiple times. And the craftsman the Craftsman pretty much stays put where you set it, despite the width. The Husky, once you size this thing up, any amount of movement or taking it on or off, this thing just keeps getting looser and looser. I mean, that's, that's just worthless. Now, why is that? When I look closer, let's look at the Craftsman first. You have your worm gear here and it is a single start worm. There's the leading edge, there's one of them as you go around. The Husky, until you look really close, there's one and there's another one. So this is a double start worm and the pitch on this worm is steeper than the corresponding pitch on the Craftsman. Even though the distance from this crest to that crest is about the same, you actually got to say, well, this one goes from here to here. And so that, you know, difference in, in angle is what allows this movable jaw and this barrel will turn as you're using it. So in my opinion, completely useless unless you're able to keep your thumb on the barrel of the, of the worm and it's just a real pain when you're trying to take a bolt on or off um, and, and, you, and you can only get one hand in there and then every time you go to you know bear against the flats this thing has opened up a sixteenth or an eighth of an inch so husky 12 inch uh, crescent wrench and probably all of its smaller brothers look for that double start um, worm and, and avoid it I would I would only get crescent wrenches that have the old school single start worm back when men were men and tools were tools so that's my advice for what it's worth so if this is easy enough to see you can tell I've got a lot of sweating on all my metal surfaces because we have a very humid day and the machines got colder at night than the dew point. Well I hope you've enjoyed that little temperature lecture from a non-meteorologist but um, this has worked uh, over the course of the winter. The cost is about, you know, in, in uh, my uh, electricity rates it's about fifty dollars per month to artificially heat one machine with an 800 watt space heater continually to keep the surface temperature elevated. I have a different method I'm going to go to long term that should be a little bit better and I will show you that in an upcoming uh, video series. It's going to be involving putting an immersion heater in the foot, heating up the coolant, which in my case is mineral oil based, and then circulating that coolant around the machine to artificially bring the temperature of the cast iron up to 
a, a temperature that will be guaranteed to be above the dew point. So that's all I have for you today. Hope you enjoyed it. Engineers Workshop, please share, like, and subscribe. And uh, we'll catch you next time with some more machining videos. Thanks.